Heather turned to run back towards the way she'd just come from, but as she did so, the man leapt from the passenger side of the car and towards her. He asked if she was alright, before grabbing her by the arm. Heather let out a horrific scream, begging him to let her go, but the man just pushed her further away from the road and towards the woods next to it. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. Episode 67, Jackie Johns. Jackie Johns grew up in Nixa, Missouri. Her mum Shirley and dad Les had Jackie and three other girls, Jeannie, Janice and Joyce. The sisters were close and Jackie was a popular child. She graduated high school and went out to work, initially doing two jobs. She'd started working at the diner just off Highway 160 in Nixa when she was just 15 years old. Her boss at Nixa Sale Barn Cafe, Jerry, hired her and immediately saw she was a good worker. She got on well with the regulars and was welcoming to new customers and worked hard. She was also a cheerleader and had been both homecoming and prom queen. She was the definition of traditional American dream and took pride in her looks and friendships. After that, Jackie continued working at the diner and started attending the local college, but she soon dropped out of college and got a second job working full-time at the local Kmart. Jackie's boyfriend, 23-year-old Cody Wright, worked at the farm attached to the diner Jackie worked at. Jackie and her best friend Lisa Fitzpatrick would hang out daily and loved to drive around together making fun of the boys who fancied them. It wasn't unusual for the boys to follow in their cars all the way to Lisa's family home, where the pair would hop out of the car, race inside and sink down below the windows, chuckling to themselves. Everyone knew Jackie and everyone knew her car. She drove a black Camaro that the locals knew as belonging to her because it had a personalised number plate saying Jackie won. One year, Lisa and Jackie had both been competing at a local beauty pageant where Jackie won and Lisa came runner-up. The pair didn't know it at the time, but while they were competing at the local pageant, someone was watching Jackie. Jackie experienced her fair share of odd customers whilst working at the diner. She was used to placating boys and men who made it known they liked the way she looked. And she could hold her own. She'd speak up if she felt like someone was being inappropriate. And one time she got so annoyed at one customer that she ended up throwing a bucket of mop water on him. She'd never done something like that before but she knew she had to stand her ground in this case and she did so. One of the customers who was a regular at the diner was a man called Gerald Carnahan. He was in his late 20s and lived with his wife, who was a little bit older than him, and her daughter, who was 19. Gerald had taken a bit of a shining towards Jackie, which wasn't unusual. Many of the customers did, but Gerald felt he knew Jackie a bit better than them. She'd briefly worked at his dad's factory in the town. Gerald came from money, he was very well off and always had been, he was used to having a wealthy family. When Jerry came to the diner, he tended to always sit in Jackie's section, and if ever there wasn't space and he had to be seated in a different section, he would get pretty annoyed. Oftentimes, he'd take it out on the other waiting staff who had to serve him that day. Even though there were some difficulties in managing the men who came into the diner, Jackie's life was full and she lived every day finding the joy in the little things. But she was worried. She told her friends that she was a bit scared when, sometimes, she'd get phone calls that made her feel uneasy. The caller would say inappropriate things, suggesting he knew what she was doing and exactly where she was. What made Jackie feel the worst about those interactions was that she recognised the man's voice. She couldn't place him though, she didn't know what his name was, so for the following few weeks, she just nicknamed him The Jerk. The man behind the calls wasn't targeting just Jackie. It soon became clear that a number of her friends and other people in the local area had gotten calls just like that, and they'd all agreed that the person on the other end of the line had sounded young, maybe around 17 or 18 years old. Although Jackie found it a bit scary or odd, she wasn't really that worried because she didn't really see it as a threat, especially as it was happening to others in the area. Usually, the phone calls would come into her parents' house, but one day, during her work at the local Kmart, she got a phone call there. 
At first, the caller commented on what she was wearing. Quote, I like what you got on today. He paused before saying, quote, you look really sexy. The calls continued and got more and more often, varying between coming into her home and her work. Then, one day she was in her bedroom when her friend had answered the phone as it rang. The friend commented that it was the, quote, creepy guy Jerry. Jerry was Gerald, the customer from the diner. It wasn't the usual call she'd get from the jerk. She knew Jerry's voice to be older. Even so, Jackie was really unnerved by the fact Jerry had called her home phone and asked her friend to say that she was busy and couldn't speak right now. On the 17th of June, 1985, Jackie woke up as usual for her early morning shift at the diner. She did the normal breakfast shift and after that went to get her hair cut. She told the hairdresser she wanted a change in her life. A new hair meant a new her. After that, she went to work at the local tanning salon for a couple of hours, but her colleagues there noticed that she did seem abnormally quiet. After her shift at the salon, she got into her car and a witness reported seeing her pull the driver's seat forward and checking behind it before she got into the car. It's almost as if she was checking to make sure no one was hiding in the back seat. Then she went home to change clothes and finally started her 5pm shift back at the diner. A little while later, she called her best friend Lisa to say she needed to talk to her later that night in person. She had something really important to tell her, but Lisa told her she couldn't meet. Her mum wanted her to stay in, the bad weather outside made it a bit dangerous for her to drive. Jackie ended up finishing her shift a little after 10pm and driving to the local 7-Eleven store. She was last seen just outside that 7-Eleven store at around 11pm. The next day, at 5am on the 18th of June 1985, a cook from the diner had been on her way to work when she'd seen a black Camaro parked up at the side of the road. The cook had recognised the car as belonging to Jackie pretty much straight away. She and all of the locals knew the car belonged to her because it had that personalised number plate saying Jackie won. The car sat at the side of the road and it looked as though it had been abandoned. The cook called her and Jackie's boss over at the diner and told him that he should probably come and check it out. Jackie's boss soon arrived at the road and looked inside the car. He could see that the door was slightly open and inside the front of the car, he saw Jackie's purse and clothes and the keys were still in the ignition. He also spotted a dark red spatter that he knew must be blood all over the back seat, front seat and the passenger side. In the back of the car, there was also a number of items of clothing that had been scattered across the seat and floor. The clothing was pretty much everything Jackie would have been wearing. A pair of blue jeans, underwear and a bra, all covered in blood. He rushed back to the cafe where he used the phone to call 911 and waited for the police to arrive. The police searched the car and in the boot of the car, what they came across was chilling. It was a car jack with a thick amount of blood on it with hair stuck to it. It was clear that something bad had happened, so the lead investigator used his radio to launch the mass search for Jackie. It wasn't long before hundreds of volunteers and working police officers were ready and willing to join the search. Some arrived on foot and others on horseback. There were also helicopters and even some private aircrafts that helped on the search. On the 22nd of June, a few men were fishing at Springfield Lake. They were about 75 yards away from the shore edge when they saw something floating in the water a short distance away from them. On a closer look, they realised it was the body of a woman. Officers arrived at the scene and identified Jackie. She was wearing the same two rings her mum had described and it was clear from the photos her parents had provided this was Jackie. She didn't have any clothes on, and there was evidence of bruising, as if a struggle had occurred. Jackie's time of death was said to be sometime after 11pm on the night she disappeared, and that she was then dumped into the water following that. A call came into the tip line just a few days after Jackie's body was found. Quote, I don't want my name used. Don't trace this. I got information. It's about that girl from the lake. I saw someone I know on the same night the paper said she disappeared. It was at the 7-Eleven. Jerry Carnahan. 
He was in his old Chevy truck parked in their lot when that girl went inside. He just sat there with his lights out. The bastard was watching for that girl. That's a fact. You need to check it out. Carnahan, I don't want the reward. The car described was distinctive and all of the locals knew the man who owned it. 28-year-old Gerald Carnahan was the same Jerry who had previously called Jackie's home phone and hung around the diner when she was on shift. Although police brought Gerald in for questioning, he told them he had an alibi. The night of Jackie's disappearance, he'd been out with his stepdaughter at a restaurant in Springfield. He said he'd had two beers, his stepdaughter had a soda and they shared some tacos. He knew there'd be a number of people who could place him there on that evening. He went on to say that they drove back home but left again separately. His stepdaughter had gone to Kmart to buy a curling iron and he'd gone to a nearby warehouse to check in on some renovations his friends were doing for him. He brought some beers and stayed for a little over 30 minutes. Then he returned home where his stepdaughter also was and they watched a TV show together before going to bed around 10.45pm. That was about 15 minutes before Jackie had last been seen. Gerald's stepdaughter told authorities that this was true and she would definitely have heard the door go or the car start up if her stepdad had left the house after that time. Gerald's car was known for having a loud muffler on it. The pair left the house together to go to work at 9.30am the next morning as normal. Officers asked Gerald if someone might have borrowed his car, maybe a relative of his, but he was adamant that no one had borrowed it. He added that they were welcome to go through it if they wanted to. It was parked right outside the station. Officers knew it would be no use. The crime had clearly happened in Jackie's car and it had been well over a week since the murder anyway. Plenty of time to clean anything that would have raised any kind of suspicion. The officer asked if Gerald would be willing to have his fingerprints taken, to which he agreed, and the same with taking a polygraph test. Gerald was calm and collected he didn't seem to be worried at all. Then, one of the officers noticed that Gerald's hands were all cut up on top of his knuckles. Gerald had an explanation for this. He'd been out playing volleyball with his friends. They'd played seven games out in the heat yesterday. That's what all the injuries were from. Officers were still suspicious, but there was nothing they could really do with no forensic evidence linking him to the scene. The following day, however, they told Gerald to come back in so that he could do his polygraph test. But even though he'd initially agreed to doing one, that night away from the station had given him a change of heart. He said that his father had told him how unreliable the tests were and his lawyer had advised against it so he wouldn't be taking one. And then, in a completely shocking turn of events, about a month later, Gerald told officers that he'd received a threat. He got a call from someone he didn't recognise, who told him they wanted $25,000 in 48 hours. If Gerald didn't get them the money, they'd call the police tip line and say they'd seen his pickup truck parked behind Jackie's car where it was eventually discovered on the night of her disappearance. Meanwhile, other leads were looked into, including taking statements from any of Jackie's ex-boyfriends and all of her friends. It became clear that over 12 women had experienced similar kinds of phone calls from this anonymous man they all called the jerk. But other than that, there were really no more new bits of information or leads that they hadn't already checked out. Their main suspect continued to be Gerald, but by the end of October 1985, officers got word that he was planning a trip to Taiwan. It wasn't unusual for him to visit there on business trips, but they were worried because they knew Taiwan didn't have any extradition treaties with the US, so if he got there, it meant he could stay and may never have to come home to face more questioning. The officers figured that they could at least arrest Gerald for tampering with evidence because of the now three witness accounts that placed his truck at the crime scene on the night of Jackie's murder and him denying it. The FBI actually had to get involved so that they could stop the plane from taking off to Taiwan and stormed on board to arrest Gerald. By this point, the officers had managed to get a warrant to take samples of Gerald's blood and hair. And then, someone close to Gerald added to the idea that he'd not been entirely truthful to the police. Gerald's brother Kennedy said that on the night of Jackie's murder, He'd been with some friends and family around a 45-minute drive out of Nixa. 
He'd returned back there that evening, sometime between 11.15 and 11.45, and as he'd driven his truck up near Highway 160, he'd seen his brother's car parked on the other side of the road, and Gerald wasn't in it. He turned to his wife, who was sat next to him, and asked if that was in fact Jerry's truck. Then, the very next day, he'd seen his brother at work and asked if his truck was parked there, but Gerald had told him no, and repeated his alibi about being home with his stepdaughter at the time. He went on to say that if the police asked him anything about seeing anything that night, he should just say he hadn't. On the 23rd of January 1986, Gerald was arrested again on evidence of tampering charges. The police didn't have enough evidence to arrest him for Jackie's murder, but they hoped a conviction of evidence tampering would at least give them enough time to get a solid case together. Ultimately though, the case against Gerald for evidence tampering wasn't strong enough. The fact he'd allegedly lied against the three witnesses who put him at the scene didn't mean he'd murdered Jackie and couldn't be proven anyway. And so the case was dismissed and Gerald was free to go. After that, the case went cold for years, and although public opinion was that Gerald had to be the perpetrator, the police didn't have solid evidence and couldn't prove it. In November of 1992, Gerald's then-wife Pat filed an order of protection against him. She alleged that he was a sadistic, out-of-control drug user. Within the protection order request, she spoke about a number of things that had happened that meant she needed protection from him, just a year after that, and eight years after Jackie's murder, in March of 1993, another shocking incident happened that had Gerald at the forefront of it. A young woman called Heather Starkey was walking along a road in Springfield at around 2am. The walk wasn't far, maybe a little over five minutes, and she'd be at her friend's house soon, but as she continued walking, she was stopped in her tracks as a white Chrysler sped up past her and then pulled in sharply, stopping her from proceeding forwards. She turned to run back towards the way she'd just come from, but as she did so, the man leapt from the passenger side of the car and towards her. He asked if she was all right before grabbing her by the arm. Heather let out a horrific scream, begging him to let her go, but the man just pushed her further away from the road and towards the woods next to them. As he did this, however, he slipped on the slushy ground and Heather managed to push away from him and break free from his hold. She managed to make it back to the road and sprinted as fast as she could towards the 24-hour grocery store just up ahead. A couple driving in a car towards the grocery store had seen the attack happening and managed to take down the number plate. As Heather stumbled into the small parking lot, the couple witnessed the man get back into the passenger side of the white Chrysler and then another man who sat in the driver's side had driven them both back off onto a side road and out of sight. Police traced the number plate as belonging to a hire car that Gerald Carnahan had been registered to. His friend, Eric Turnage, had been the one driving and told officers he hadn't known why Gerald had told him to pull over on the side of the road that night. After Gerald had gotten back into the car, he told Eric it was all just a misunderstanding. Gerald was charged with attempted kidnapping and was released on bail of $15,000. Now remember that Gerald's family is extremely rich, so accessing this kinds of bail money is really, really easy to him. Soon after that, there was a trial for the kidnapping, where Heather said she was scared to testify. She stated that she was frightened of Gerald after having heard that he'd been the prime suspect in Jackie's case. At trial, Gerald's defence was that he had just slipped on the icy ground and grabbed onto the passing Heather Starkey so that he wouldn't fall over. This didn't explain why it had looked so much like an attack to the witnesses passing by in the car or why he dragged her towards the woods. The jury did find him guilty and Gerald was sentenced to just two years. Obviously, that's not great, but what that conviction did do was it allowed people to see a clear link between attempted kidnapping charge and the murder of Jackie. Then, in 2006, a new cold case officer was assigned to Jackie's case. The officer spent the next year getting to grips with the case, reading over the files, and came across Jerry's. It showed him a fuller picture of who the man really was, including all of his criminal charges over the years. By the year 2007, forensic techniques had significantly progressed in comparison to 1985, when evidence had been taken from the crime scene. 
A semen swab taken from the scene was sent for testing and came back as having a DNA profile. This was excellent news. It meant that with the right suspect, the cold case officer would be able to get a match and prove beyond reasonable doubt who the murderer was. The officer firstly got a DNA sample from Cody, Jackie's boyfriend back in 1985. It was shown to not be a match as expected. And then, warrant in hand, the officer went to visit Gerald and obtained a DNA sample from him. It was quickly proven that Gerald's DNA was consistent with the profile taken from the crime scene. Gerald was arrested in 2007, 22 years after he'd attacked and killed Jackie Johns. Of course, Gerald pleaded not guilty and so the case did go to trial. He still had a ton of family money so it was easy for him to hire the best lawyers in the area and they argued that the DNA evidence was old, it hadn't been thoroughly tracked and they said that the eyewitness testimony the prosecution would undoubtedly use was unreliable. The trial began in September of 2010 and Gerald's brother Kenny had been subpoenaed by the prosecution so he would be testifying about having seen his brother's car near to the crime scene at around the time of the murder. A blood spatter analysis testified that most of the blood was found in the driver's side back seat but that there was more blood throughout the car. The expert added that it was likely there had been a struggle where Jackie had been hit a number of times by someone's fists and then another object. Gerald's stepdaughter from his previous marriage also testified, confirming her original story that she had seen him at 10.30pm when she'd went to bed and the next morning when they travelled to work together at 9.30am. She added that if he had left in the middle of the night, she would have thought that she'd have heard it. But if he did leave... She didn't hear it. Gerald Carnahan was found guilty of first degree murder and in the sentencing phase of the trial, the jury was told about Gerald's criminal record, something they'd not been allowed to know before they chose guilty or non-guilty verdict. Ultimately, Gerald Carnahan was sentenced to life without parole. And in October 2020, a judge upheld the conviction after Gerald requested a new trial. Over the years, there have been a number of other disappearances linked to Gerald. Debbie Sue Lewis was 31 years old when she disappeared. Her car was found on Highway 160 with one door open, the keys in the ignition and her purse on the front seat. In December 1987, her remains were found in some woods. Angela Hammond was speaking on a payphone at around 11.45pm in April 1991 in Clinton, Missouri when she was abducted. Angela's boyfriend managed to chase the car until his broke down and then he lost them. Angela has not been seen since. In June of 1992, two friends, Stacy McCall and Susie Streeter, had just graduated from high school in Springfield, Missouri. The pair and Susie's mum Cheryl Levitt disappeared that night and haven't been seen since. Their case is well documented and has been nicknamed the Springfield Three. Jackie's three sisters, Joyce, Jeannie and Janice, set up a scholarship fund in Jackie's name and every year the scholarship is awarded to a Nixa High School senior to honour and remember Jackie's legacy. 